as we move from our winter series talking about our questions and doubts into this early season of Lent and our new sermon series, Trustfall, we want to acknowledge that a deep and vibrant, personal, life-altering kind of faith does not come from simply having all of our questions answered or getting all the facts sorted in our minds. Our faith begins when we make a conscious decision to trust God, not only with our souls, but with our very lives. And so our scripture passage this morning comes from the last book in the Bible, from John's vision from the book of Revelation. And I think it is apropos to remind us that this vision comes, this is Jesus talking 60 years after he's died. This is Jesus' spirit coming and talking to John with this timeless, this timeless promise that Jesus continues to make to us today. Listen carefully for the word of God. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is the word of God for the people of God. We all come to faith in a lot of different ways for a lot of different reasons, don't we? Our intellect and reasoning knowledge can only take us so far. After all, there is a lot of stuff for us to know in this world. Like, I don't know if you knew that a pregnant goldfish is called a twit. Did you know that? Or that a jiffy is actually an honest-to-goodness unit of time. It's one one-hundredth of a second. Did you know that the pound key on your keyboard is called a octothorpe? Or that the dot over an I is called a tittle? You might not have known that. Did you know that Dr. Seuss actually calls himself Dr. Seuss? Or that whiteout, you know, that stuff we hardly ever use anymore, was invented by the mom of the monkey's guitarist, Michael Nesmith? Or that a military salute comes from the Middle Ages when knights used to parade past the kings and they would lift their visors so that the kings could see their face. There's always new stuff to learn. I had never heard this term quantum entanglement until we were doing the series last, last month. It's crazy, some of these scientific discoveries. I never knew that that was a thing since the time of Einstein, but it has everything to do with our concepts of prayer and interconnectedness and really the existence of God. I think I'm going to need to do a lot more thinking about that one. There is just a lot of stuff to know in this world. And especially when it comes to our faith, knowing stuff can only take us so far. I love some of the mistakes and misperceptions that kids make. Have you ever read any of those books, Kids Say the Darndest Things, or any of that? One group of third graders was asked what the epistles are. They said they were the wives of the apostles. <laughs> and when asked who Noah's wife was, they said, Joan of Arc. <laughs> the same group was asked about Lot's wife, and one little boy said, she was a pillar of salt by day, but a ball of fire by night. <laughs> and when one eight-year-old girl was asked to describe what's unique about Christian marriage, she said, well, Christians are supposed to marry just one person. They call it monotony. <laughs> and it's not just kids, is it? As hard as we try, none of us have it all figured out. None of us get all of our ducks in a row when it comes to our faith. Because knowledge can only bring you so far. I feel a little bad throughout this series on doubt, the way we tended to keep things so cerebral, very logical, as if our faith is primarily some kind of intellectual exercise. 
as if grappling with our doubts, having our questions answered, proving that you can't disprove God is all it's going to take for us to have this deep, fulfilling, rich, satisfying spiritual life that we all hunger for. Which, of course, is so ridiculously Presbyterian of me. There are obviously a lot of different reasons that people choose Just as there are a lot of reasons that people choose not to believe, that have nothing to do with their questions or their doubts. Sometimes our doubts become excuses that we hide behind when we aren't sure we want to believe. Some people are too proud to admit that they need anyone or anything, that their life is not totally their own, and they're not the center of the universe. Others don't feel worthy. Still others are scared, worried about what will change in their life if they begin to believe. What they might have to give up or what they might be asked to do. I remember one woman in my old congregation said that she was so scared to become a Christian because she was just sure if she did that God was going to send her to the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa and she hated jungles. There are even those who know that taking the next step in their faith would be the best thing for them, but they're not sure that they're quite ready yet. I don't know if you remember St. Augustine. He, for years, felt like God was asking him to come and make a commitment, and yet he was trying to push it off because he was having too much fun. He was running around with a crowd of young, young men in the big city. They were drinking all the time and carousing with women. In his book, The Confessions of St. Augustine, he prays a very honest and very famous prayer where he says, God, make me chaste but just not quite yet. <laughs> people choose to believe for a lot of different reasons, and people choose not to believe for a lot of different reasons. But there's no question that belief is about a whole lot more than just becoming intellectually convinced. Since the beginning of time, most people on this earth, of every culture and continent, every century, time and place, have all shared this deep down, nagging, unshakable conviction that there has to be something more than just what we see. That someone or something has created them and put them here for a reason, and that the central goal in life is to somehow come back into relationship with their creator. In fact, no one denies it, not even those who most fiercely argue against the existence of God, that there is a universal part of our human psyche that has this propensity to believe, believe in God, that somehow this is just hardwired into our souls. Or that there is, as Augustine put it, a God-sized hole in each one of our hearts that we all long to fill. A restlessness in our hearts that will only be quenched, as Augustine put it, when our hearts rest in thee. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. Others come to faith, come to Christ, when they're at their wit's end, not sure where else to turn. People who are struggling to cope, filled with hurt and regrets, longing for a strong, trustworthy, reliable place where they can lay their burdens down, to find help, and healing, and hope, for them, it's often Christ's offer that's irresistible. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For many, we are like the boy Paco in Ernest Hemingway's short story, The Capital of the World. I've told this story many times before because it's one of my favorite, but in it, the Spanish teenager named Paco, a very common name in Spain, has a very tense relationship with his dad that becomes more and more strained until they have this huge blowout and Paco storms out of the house and runs away from home. His dad ends up launching this massive search to try to find him but to no avail and finally after a couple of years when he's totally desperate he takes out an ad in the main newspaper in Madrid saying Paco please meet me in front of the square of the newspaper office at noon on Friday all is forgiven and when the dad arrives at the plaza it is packed with 800 Pacos all seeking the forgiveness of their fathers. Because this is our story. This is the human story. For so many, there is this sense that something vital is missing in our lives until we fill that void with a relationship with God. But for others, it really is as simple as just laying our questions and doubts down. Not giving up on them, but putting them to the side. Putting them on a shelf so that we can be free to live as if God were real. So we can be free to live the life that we've always wanted. When I was down in Houston, Vic Pence was the pastor at First Pres in Houston before moving to Peachtree in Atlanta. And when Vic was in Houston, he told me the story of a man, a college professor, who had made an appointment to come in and talk to him about all of his questions and doubts. And after a long conversation, Vic ended up giving him a copy of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Any of you know that one? And the screw tape letters. Definitely the thinking person's rationalizations on how to believe while keeping your intellectual integrity. And a few weeks later, the man came back in to see Vic, and he announced, I have become a Christian. And Vic said, I knew it. It was C.S. Lewis, wasn't it? He works every time. But the man said, no, actually, it was a dream. Vic said, a dream? He said, well, maybe it was more of a vision, but it, it felt an awful lot like a dream. He said, but it was so real. I dreamt that I was walking down this long corridor carrying this huge backpack on my back. And at the end of the hallway, I came to a door, and through that door, I saw the most beautiful room I've ever seen in my life. There were all these people in it, and they were laughing and talking and having the time of their lives. It was all flooded with light and love. And he said, I knew immediately that in that room was everything I ever wanted in life. And so I tried to go in, but I couldn't because my backpack was too big to fit through the doorway. I tried turning sideways, but it was too large and bulky and it wouldn't fit through. And then he said, but then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Suddenly it all became so clear. That backpack was filled with all of my doubts and questions about the faith, all of my fears and concerns that were keeping me from committing my life to God, from stepping through that door, from having the life I wanted. And Vic said, so what did you do? And the man said, it was the most amazing thing. As I was straining and squeezing and tugging and pulling, I suddenly heard this calm, kind, crystal clear voice 
It just simply said, just take the backpack off. And so I took it off. And I left it. Right there in the hallway, right next to the door. I just left it there and walked inside. It was the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. I knew that backpack wasn't going anywhere. I knew it would be right there anytime I wanted to come back and explore or revisit my doubts or my questions. But I was not going to let it keep me out of that room one minute longer. And ever since, I just feel like I've been living inside of that room and it is like all of my dreams have come true. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. I really do want to apologize. If we have ever given you the impression, especially during these last six weeks, that all we have to do is get it all figured out, find adequate answers to our questions, dispel our doubts, and that will be the same thing as stepping into the room. As we said a couple times over this last series, believers and unbelievers, we all have the exact same inconclusive, contradictory evidence for and against the existence of God. But at some point, each of us needs to make a choice. The backpack is never going away, but only we can choose if we're going to wear it or not. If we're going to allow it to keep us out of the room and the life we've always wanted, I want to be really clear here. There is a world of difference between believing in marriage and getting married. Between acknowledging that the person standing in front of you loves you and you love them and your soulmates and actually standing up and making promises to them and committing your life to them. At some point, our faith has to take that all-important 10-inch journey from being something we do up here to something we commit our lives to in here. To a certain kind of life, a certain way of living, a certain way of orientating our entire being. Now for some people, that is a gigantic, extremely emotional decision that entails a complete 180 degree turn, a whole new life, a total change to everything. But for others, it's as simple as making a decision to commit our lives to the thing that we have always believed. Because again, let me be very clear, hopefully clearer than we Presbyterians usually are, that this faith of ours, it becomes faith. It begins to make a difference in our lives not when we begin to believe, but when we decide to say yes and open that door, to put down that backpack, when we decide to take what Kierkegaard called the leap of faith. My old youth pastor used to call it the nesty plunge. Anyone remember those commercials way back when? For the purposes of this series, we're calling it Trust Fall. I don't know if you all remember that, ever did any of those on some corporate retreat or Christian youth camp. You stand straight with your arms crossed across your chest. You close your eyes and allow yourself to fall backwards into the waiting arms of someone who is going to catch you. And of course, no matter how convinced you are that that person is there and ready and able to catch you. It's still scary. It still takes a lot of courage and a lot of trust. But if you've ever done one, you know that when you do it, something happens inside of you. In fact, a few things happen inside of you. 
You get the exhilaration of just letting go, of not having to be so damn in control of everything all the time. You feel the empowerment of knowing that someone cares about you is not going to let you fall and hurt yourself. And then when you're caught, there is no more exhilarating feeling in the world, maybe other than jumping out of an airplane. And it's like this incredible, almost intimate bond is instantly formed between you and the one who catches you. There is something about this season of Lent that opens the door to a very different kind of spiritual growth than at any other time during the church year. For many, these 40 days offer a unique opportunity for a very personal spiritual renewal and deepening sense of God's intimacy in our lives. May you be reminded in these next few weeks, that you are not so much a person who has a soul as you are a soul that happens to have a person or a body. That there is an inner you, and then there is the outer you. And the outer you is getting a little older and falling apart a little bit more each and every day, as I notice whenever I look in the mirror. But that the inner you can be renewed day by day if you're willing to really pay attention to the part of you that is eternal.